This is the first video in our new course on the nature of organizations. And I want to kick off by answering the question, what is an organization? An organization is a grouping of people, assets, material or knowledge that are coordinated to meet a set of objectives or to serve a purpose. Effectively, organizations serve a need. The need to control something that is bigger and more complex than any one individual or a small informal group of individuals can hold in their heads. To do this, organizations bring a range of people and resources together and they use them to carry out a range of interconnected, interrelated activities. In doing so, there is a tendency for organizations to become bureaucratic and hierarchical. And that may just be the price that we have to pay, but we'll look at that more in a later video. I think the most incisive comment and descriptor comes from the author Richard Pascal. He said that organizations are, in the last analysis, interactions among people. This view of an organization as a network of relationships nicely straddles the two views that people have about what an organization is. On the one hand, we have the metaphor of an organization as a structure. In Pascal's description, it is a network. And on the other hand, we have the metaphor of an organization as a set of processes, the interactions in Pascal's description. We'll look in more detail at these two approaches to understanding organizations as either a set of processes or as a structure in videos that will follow soon. But the last thing I want to say here is that organizations can either be temporary or permanent. But the one thing they cannot be is static. They must evolve to meet changing needs, to exploit new opportunities, or to counter emerging threats. There are many, many examples of permanent organizations. There are corporations and companies, partnerships, governments, and government departments, local governments, hospitals, schools, universities, emergency services like the police or the fire service. There are military units, clubs, societies, and associations. There are probably fewer types of temporary organizations, even though the absolute number of them in existence at any one time is probably vastly superior. We have teams and projects and expeditions and crews and committees. But one thing is certain about organizations. Organizations may be able to function perfectly well without managers, but managers cannot function without an organization within which to serve. Why do I say this? because it is the job of a group of managers to make an organization work effectively. And that is why, as a manager, you need to understand the nature of organizations. Sometimes the best way to understand something complex and abstract is with a carefully chosen metaphor. In 1989, Gareth Morgan suggested eight different metaphors that we can use to help us to understand the nature of organizations. No one of these metaphors completely captures the nature of an organization on its own. But if we bring together all eight of them, we can look at organizations from a range of different perspectives and gain a better understanding. So in this video, I want to look at Gareth Morgan's eight organizational metaphors. Metaphor 
Morgan's first metaphor is of the organization as a machine. This is a metaphor that stresses the importance of process and efficiency. But it does so, of course, at the cost of the human dimension of an organization. There is little place for people in a machine. And consequently, it also serves to emphasize the importance of rigid structure at the cost of compromising an organization's agility and ability to flex. However, Morgan's second metaphor, that of the organization as an organism, addresses this because, of course, organisms adapt to their environments. The problem with this, though, of course, is that if an organism fails to adapt, then it fails to survive. And that holds a very valuable lesson for us in thinking about how organizations really work. Morgan's third metaphor is of the organization as a brain. It focuses on information processing. It sees an organization as something that takes in knowledge and information through its senses and is able to process that information and use it to a benefit. It sees organizations as creative and rational entities. And rather like real brains, organizations are in fact limited by their ability to gather information universally. Organizations like our brains focus on specific pieces of information and they have limitations in their ability to process it. So the brain metaphor adds something else of value to our understanding of organizations. Morgan's fourth perspective is of organizations as cultures. Each organization has its own set of values and beliefs and traditions and rituals. It is a bundle of these. And to the extent that people within the organization share those beliefs, share those values, share those traditions, then that strengthens the organization. But it can also give it a certain rigidity. And without a doubt, culture is important in understanding the nature of a specific organization. In fact, there is an important quote that culture eats strategy for lunch. That is to say, if you want your organization to succeed, then get the culture right. That is far more important than having the right strategy, but a poor culture. Fifth, Morgan saw organizations as political systems. This stresses the role of different interests and agendas, the roles of networking, alliances, influences, and yes, of power. And without doubt, every interaction within an organization is a political interaction. And if you are to be a successful manager within any organization, you need to grow political acumen. You need to understand how people operate in a political environment and develop the skills to operate effectively yourself. Morgan's sick metaphor takes us to the dark side. He sees organizations as psychic prisons. They can repress and restrain the people within the organization, confining them to a set of behaviors and a set of traditions and rituals which may not suit them well. Not everybody enjoys working within their organization. And in that sense, organizations can be toxic to the people within them. He notes that this can arise from both unconscious and conscious choices and norms of behavior within the organization. If you are running an organization, if you are an important part of an organization, and you feel it is to you or to the people around you some form of psychic prison, you need to look back at the culture and what elements of the culture are consciously or unconsciously restraining you and the people around you. Morgan's seventh metaphor is one of flux and transition. 
Morgan sees organizations as constantly changing and adapting to the environment within which they find themselves. That adaptation can be planned and well organized, or it can be chaotic. And recognizing that, we can see that one of the roles for senior managers in the organization is to get the rate of change and the amount of control right for that organization's culture and for the environment it finds itself in. The more chaotic you are, typically the more nimbly you can adapt to situations, but the less control that you have over how you do that, and therefore the lower the levels of accountability and the greater the levels of uncertainty for people within the organization. And finally, Morgan saw organizations as instruments of domination. They are a means to overcome and dominate their competition, socially, economically, or politically. Or indeed, in the case of militaristic organizations, even physically. No one of these metaphors is sufficient to understand an organization. It's when we bring them all together that we can see different dimensions of what organizations are and how they work. Morgan's eight metaphors are a powerful way to get insights into what organizations are, how they work, and therefore what your role is within the organization you work for. The nature of an organization can be viewed in two ways, either as a process or set of processes, or as a structure or framework of relationships. In this video, we're going to understand the view of an organization as a structure or framework of relationships. I guess you're likely to be familiar with the typical organization charts or organograms that we see in most organizations. These break down the organization in some way, usually by function or by region or by division. It's these organization charts that represent the organization as a structural unit. These charts reflect formal relationships and flows of authority. Often they represent these as a hierarchy. They mirror or are mirrored by the physical nature of the organization, its assets, its products, its services, or its geography. Peter Drucker suggested we can understand and analyze organizational structure in terms of three things, activities, decision-making, and relationships. Although I would add pragmatically a fourth geography, often organizational structures do reflect the geography, particularly of multinational organizations. In many organizations, the need for accountability and oversight governance, if you like, imposes a strong hierarchical element to the organizational structure. However, this need not be the case. And in some future videos within this course, we will look at a range of different organizational structures, some of which are very far from hierarchical. However, what is important to know is that usually Sitting within whatever formal structure there is will be a number of informal structures coexisting within the organization. The formal structure will have been planned and executed by senior management. The informal structure is likely to arise spontaneously out of the culture and personalities of the managers within the organization. Usually, these informal structures are also temporary. They will arise, they will morph and change, and they will fade away according to the needs of the people within the organization to serve the organization and to do their jobs as well as they can. 
Effectively, it is these temporary, informal structures that allow a rigid, formal structured organization to act flexibly and adapt to changing circumstances. Therefore, it's my assertion that highly controlling organizations that seek to quash these informal structures and reimpose the formal structure are likely to be the ones that, in the long term, cannot ride out big changes because their agility is too limited by the rigid structure and by denying the possibility of forming informal structures to meet changing needs, they deny their own ability to adapt to change. So an organization can be viewed as a structure. It can also be viewed as a process. So take a look at the accompanying video to find out more about that. We can view an organization in one of two ways, either as a structure or some form of framework of relationships, or as a process or a set of processes. And in this video, I want to look at how we can understand organizations as sets of processes. To understand organizations as a process or as a set of processes, I think we first need to understand the nature of a process. And there are four components to think about. The first of those, almost obviously, is inputs. This is ideas, information, knowledge, strategy, or materials or equipment that goes into making things happen. Second, there are controls. Controls are the sets of rules that make certain things happen and stop other things happen. They drive the process. Third, we have mechanisms. This is the people or the technology, the systems or the suppliers that make things happen. They execute the rules. They exert control over what's going on. And finally, a process has outputs, the stuff that comes out of the process, either new information, new services, new products. Whatever it is that the process is set up to create, if the process is working, it emerges as an output. There are two ways we can look at an organization as a set of processes. We can, first of all, take the organizing perspective. From this point of view, what we're fundamentally saying is an organization is a body that organizes stuff. The processes that it creates are there to make stuff happen. The second perspective is taking a look at an organization from the point of view of a value chain, a set of processes that start with something of low value and turn out something of higher value that enables the organization to earn the revenue that feeds it. In a way, this is like looking at organizations as an organism, which we saw in our video about Morgan's eight metaphors. An organism needs to take in some food in order to provide the excess power to do work. And it's the same with organizations. They take in raw materials or unfinished products and they finish those products and put them out. And that generates a value which feeds the organization and perpetuates its existence. From an organizing perspective, here are some of the processes that we would expect to see in any or most organizations determining activities that are needed to accomplish the organization's objectives, the grouping of related activities, securing the resources to carry out those activities, then the division and allocation of the work, delegating authority to make stuff happen, and coordinating the efforts of different persons, different groups, in order to deliver value. 
we can see that those kinds of processes are going to happen throughout the value chain. So what is the value chain? Well, the value chain is a set of processes that drive value. Let's take a look at some of those typical processes. The first process is understanding what your customer needs or what it is that the organization will need to create to generate value. Then there are a whole set of processes around research and development of the services or products the organization is going to create. And then there is the sourcing of raw materials and equipment and assets and people. And then there's the purchasing of those raw materials or assets, their delivery and the whole supply chain. Then there's the processing or manufacture or creation processes. We've got marketing processes which bring the organization services or products to the awareness of people who might need them. And then the selling processes which trigger the purchase. Then we've got processes around delivery, another aspect of the supply chain. And finally, there's the delivery of service that goes with the products or services that the value chain has created. Organizations are filled with processes. And back in the late 1990s, it became very fashionable to map out those processes and to re-engineer them to become more efficient. Without a doubt, that has led to various movements like Lean and Six Sigma, which have aimed to optimize those processes in different ways. However, if you start with the understanding that organizations are filled with processes and that understanding those processes will help you to understand your organization, then you will be in a good place to better understand your role as a manager. In other videos in this course, we've looked at what an organization is and how we can understand it through a series of metaphors or as a set of processes or as a framework of a structure. But in this video, I want to go in a slightly different direction and understand what are the features of an organization. What does an organization need to have in order to work? No doubt there are many, many features that an organization needs to have to work effectively and efficiently. I've sat down and I've listed as many as I can think of. These are the big features. And I'd like to say I came to a nice, neat round number, 10 features or 12 features. The fact is, I came to 11. It is what it is. Without a doubt, I've missed out some detailed features, but these 11 features you would expect to see in any organization. And the first of them is some form of mission, some form of vision, some form of goal. Something that tells the organization and the people within the organization and the organization stakeholders where it's heading, what it is trying to achieve, what it is there for. And the second feature is a strategy, some way of understanding how it is going to achieve its goal, how it is going to meet its vision, how it is going to deliver on its mission. Goals, visions, missions last a long time. Strategies tend to last slightly less time. And of course, underneath them are going to be a hierarchy of plans and projects and programs and stuff like that, which could be other features of our organization. I could include them as separate features to get my list up to 12, 13, 14, 15, but I shan't. Number one is a goal. Number two is a strategy. Number three are a set of processes or systems or procedures, the way that the organization does things to deliver its strategy. And since we've looked in other videos at organizations as a set of processes and 
at organizations as a set of structures, then yes, the fourth feature organizations have is some form of structure that tells people how they relate to one another, how their work is organized and coordinated. The next thing an organization needs to have is physical resources, assets, equipment, buildings, materials, raw materials or unfinished goods. All of these physical resources contribute to making the products or services that the organization delivers. And next is people. There's a better word for human resources, and that word is people. Talk about people rather than human resources, and you get out of the mindset that you can buy and sell and trade people. You can let them down casually. They are your colleagues, and it is the people that make an organization work. Without people, organizations wouldn't exist. And those people build a culture. These are the values, the norms of behavior, the beliefs, the traditions, the rituals that people bring to an organization. In a good organization, you will grow a set of values and norms of behavior that serve the organization well. It creates a good culture that people enjoy working in. In a bad organization, the culture can get very toxic, and usually that is down to the behaviors of a small number of influential people. But whenever you hear about an organization's culture, all you need to do is to think about the way people within that organization expect and feel that they are expected to behave. Next, an organization needs some form of governance. This is the set of policies, procedures, rules by which people are accountable, by which actions are suitably transparent to external observers, and by which work is overseen and people are held to account for what they do or do not do. Next, an organization needs knowledge. It needs intellectual capital. It needs experiences, skills, capabilities, and that is what people bring to the organization. And whilst we will talk about the way organizations store that information in a moment, let's not forget that most of the knowledge within an organization sits within people's brains. When people leave, organizations lose knowledge. But the next feature of an organization is memory. And this exists in two ways. It exists in the heads of the people within the organization, the collective wisdom, the collective memory of the organization. But it also increasingly exists within the stored knowledge of the organization in paper and electronic format. The challenge for this stored set of knowledge the cumulative lessons learned that have been laid down in paper or electronic format is that when people leave, the organization can forget that it is there. You create a set of unknown knowns, things the organization knows, but it doesn't know it knows. If it doesn't know it knows them, then it has effectively forgotten it. Good organizations have good memories. And that memory lies within the way it treats its people. And finally, number 11, I would be remiss if I did not mention technology. In today's modern world, it is inconceivable that an organization can function without some proper set of technology. But hey, it has always been thus. 19th century organizations relied on transport and pens and paper in the same way that modern organizations rely on transport and computers. Go back far enough and ancient organizations were using hieroglyphics and the wheel to make their work happen. 
So my 11 features of organizations, if you think I have forgotten any, and it is entirely possible I have, then add them to the comments below so that we can all debate whether they are important and valuable features of all organizations or just details that are appropriate to some. I look forward to seeing some great new content in the comments below. In the meantime, please do give us a thumbs up if you like this video. There's loads more great management courses content to come, so please do subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of it. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video, and in the meantime, keep learning.